I'll start out. Um, we're going to kind of just go down the line here and let everybody know who we all are and what we do. Um, so I will start. My name is Zach. Uh, I've got a platform called Millennial Farmer, and I'm on basically everything on social media. There's a couple that I'm not on, but um, I mostly concentrate on YouTube. And the reason that I started it um, was because I wanted to relate to people about what goes on on the farms, you know, what's actually happening on the farms. I have friends and family member that uh, grew up in the area that I did that come from rural places and I feel like they should understand stuff about farming. But I was seeing a lot of stuff online that uh, just wasn't true. Stuff that, you know, maybe they had a hint of truth in there, but they didn't really understand why we're using genetically modified seed in certain situations, why we use drain tile or pesticides, um, the science that we know behind those things and why we use those management practices, how we treat livestock. And what I wanted to do was really just bring an inside view from the farm to, to people that were interested. So that's who I am. That's what I do. I think we'll go down the line here. Just go ahead, introduce yourself and, and let everybody know who you are. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Natalie Kovorek. My husband and I ranch here in Nebraska. Um, we have a cow-calf. Um, we also have a growing registered herd background, um, heifer development, and custom AI. Um, about four years ago, I originally started sharing online um, to promote a ranch truck beef business I had. And I did that for about two years, and then um, I ended up pivoting away from that. I felt kind of called and compelled to share more of like our personal ranching story. Um, and I really it was very limited, kind of the scope of what I thought I would share. I started out really highlighting kind of what you know, I saw through my, my ranch wife eyes. Um, but in the last two years, it's really grown um, beyond that. I would say um, I still share online. My main platform is Instagram, um, but I've kind of pivoted more into advocacy for the industry. I think a lot of people associate my content with um, like education and information, which is not my favorite thing because it sounds like so, um, I don't know, like heavy. And I think I like to do a lot of it like with humor and creativity. Um, I have also since uh, started a um, two businesses. One is Elevate Ag, which teaches producers, um, farmers, ranchers who want to learn how to share online. Um, it's an online course in a community to give you the tools to do that, to kind of create that successful um, social presence and then get an ROI from it if you want to. And I've also just uh, co-founded Discover Ag, which is a podcast where uh, my co-host and I um, highlight um, trending and relevant news articles in the ag and food space and kind of like a really entertaining um, kind of modern way. I think we're putting, I guess we're putting our personality on uh, the industry. And so um, I'm excited to be on this panel today and kind of share what I've learned about social media um, through my, you know, last four years of, of journeying online. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Mike Galloway. I am from Northeast Wyoming. Actually, I'm originally, originally from Montana. Uh, my, I always like to say that I'm a first generation nothing. Um, I started out uh, after high school and all that kind of good stuff uh, in radio and TV and actually worked in radio and TV for quite a few years. I married my wife who her stepdad ranched in Northeast Wyoming and in 2008 he had a heart attack and we went back to help out on the ranch for the winter. He couldn't get in the tractor, he couldn't feed the cows. So we decided to go back and give him a hand and we never left. Uh, my wife got into farmer's market, we started getting into local food, and eventually in 2008, uh, we made a really quick video about uh, our cows and how we feed our cows. And what we were trying to do was market our beef at local farmer's markets. And that video actually went viral, and we ended up with a YouTube channel with 1,500 subscribers and uh, didn't know what to do with it. But we started looking at the comments, and the comments were, you know, when are you going to go milk your cows? Sorry, Dan. <laughs> um, which of your cows gives the chocolate milk? Um, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and we realized we had an opportunity to educate people about where their food comes from, and more importantly, the families behind it. So we've just kind of taken the ball and, and ran with it there and, and hope that people listen and learn something along the way. My name is Dan Venteiker. Uh, back in 2012, I really liked this handle I thought of for Twitter called Iowa Dairy Farmer. So I went on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, whatever social media apps back in 2012 were around and I took the name Iowa Dairy Farmer on all of them and then I did nothing for 10 years. And for some reason, about 
a year ago in March of 2021 on TikTok, I decided to start sharing some stuff about our farm and what we do for the dairy industry. I think kind of similar to what Zach had said, I, I feel like I saw that even more magnified in the dairy industry because if you look at any animal rights page, you're going to see a plethora of things about dairy farming that there might be some truth, but some of them are just a flat out lie. And so some of that, me being more of a confrontational person, um, I kind of took the approach of trying to educate, but I also you know, wanted to take the aspect from my platform of here's what they're saying, here's what's actually true. So we started doing that about 20 months ago, 16 months ago, I started posting on Facebook. And so we kind of took the same approach there where we're mostly, we do educational content about the dairy industry. So I never run out of content because Kyle's never run out of stupid stuff to do. <laughs> Neither does Dan. That's true. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Laura Wilson. On the internet, I go as Laura Farms. So Farms isn't my real last name, which a lot of people, I think, think is the truth. Um, but I have, I'm part of the generation that like, like has been on social media since they could walk pretty much. Um, and so I have constantly been posting everything that I do on social media my entire life. And so when I started farming in the spring of 2020, it only seemed natural that I would just start another Instagram account. And what am I doing? Laura Farms. And so I started posting some things. I had a video actually go viral on Twitter and then Reddit. And from there I said, well, if I'm going to do anything on social media, now's my chance. And so I started a YouTube channel and now I post vlog style videos of what I do every single day um, on the farm. And like I said, I'll probably never run out of content. Um, but kind of like what they were saying, I am just shocked at even the people in my area. I, I am from Nebraska. I'm just two hours west of here. I am shocked at the lack of education there is in rural communities. I had friends who didn't know what a tractor or combine did, and that just blew me away. And so I'm just sharing my story, what I do every single day on the farm, and I have no plans of stopping. So that's me. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Grant Hilbert, and uh, I didn't grow up on a farm or anything, and so I end up, ended up in 2014 becoming a virtual farmer. So I played uh, a game called Farming Somewhere on YouTube at the age of 15, and I was just a young kid out there making videos on YouTube, just kind of trying to make it. Uh, essentially. And so uh, videos kind of started going viral and a lot of little kids kind of started watching the YouTube channel from uh, 2014 to 2016. And then from 2016 to 2020, uh, I ran the Farming Simulator YouTube channel uh, throughout college when I was at the time, just at nights making videos and stuff like that. And eventually in 2020, uh, I kind of made enough revenue and money from that to eventually like start a real life farm, something that's always kind of been a dream. And so then I started uh, another YouTube channel called Grant Hilbert. And that was honestly a inspiration from, from Zach and kind of seeing what he did on YouTube. And so on that channel, I just document kind of the daily life of a beginning farmer. And I don't really, I'd say, know everything about farming. And so I can't really teach the audience everything, but I kind of bring the audience along to kind of just teach of all the mistakes I'll make and stuff on YouTube. And so I can't say I'm really connecting direct to consumer, but I'll allow people to kind of watch all the mistakes a young beginning farmer makes. So, so kind of sticking with that, I want to stick with you for a second here, Grant. Um, you had mentioned kind of where you've gone with this from the farm simulator stuff to what you're doing now. Can you talk a little bit about how YouTube kind of helped you do that? And then we're going to, we're going to kind of go through here and, and talk with some other opportunities that I know some of you have had as well that have come through it. So t like, tell us how YouTube really helped you kick that off and, and get you going. Yeah. So really, I mean, we, we first started YouTube, uh, kind of on the business side, you know, I, I was kind of a young kid, entrepreneurial focus and stuff. And we knew you could make, you know, a little bit of money from YouTube. And so um, me, my buddy started another channel. I started this channel and, uh, and it ended up kind of taking off. And so, you know, once you start getting a certain amount of views and stuff, you get, you start getting some ad revenue from it and stuff. And so, you know, those four years of when I was at college, I just kind of focused hard to, and it kind of turned into a full-time job at college. Um, and then, and then from there it was like, oh, wow, I could, I could maybe afford a, a, a piece of farmland. I was like, somehow I can, I can make it happen. And so I didn't necessarily want to go after a, you know, flat 80. I was like, I need something I can, that's going to be good content and I can fix up and stuff like that. And so really YouTube was the big thing that once you start getting enough views, it, uh, the monetization allowed to get started farming. We know farming's really a capital intensive. And so YouTube really made it happen for me. So even when you're out there looking for farmland, you were thinking about the content you could make from that piece of farmland. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> that is such a YouTuber thing. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, Mike, I know you you kind of have used YouTube in a, in somewhat similar but a different way to really market your own stuff on the farm. Yeah, I mean, YouTube really became a business for us. I mean, um, you can go out and you can chase down subscribers and views and everything else. And it makes you feel good, but at the end of the day, you still have to eat. And our problem in Northeast Wyoming was drought. And we'd seen it going on for years and years. We came to the ranch in 2018. My father-in-law passed away in 2012, and we were faced with pretty much a dilemma of my mother-in-law inherited the ranch. And um, we all got together and we said, you know, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna sell the thing and move on? Or are we gonna try to make a go of it? And we decided to make a go for it. And by 2017, it was just not looking good. Um, we we were in drought. Uh, we were buying hay every single year. Not a whole lot of hay relief out there for us. So um, it was a matter of you know every dollar was going into hay, and that's what we were trying to keep keep the ranch going with that. And uh, everybody was going into debt and everything else. And we were doing farmers market at the time. And like when the YouTube thing kicked off, I guess we didn't really realize that we the opportunity that we had right away. So it took a little bit for us to go. Okay, you know, like I said, the views are good and everything else, but. Um, we have to build a business around this. So taken from our farmer's market experience and local food, our first step was to break away from farmer's market and we actually put a farm store on the ranch. And so that brought people, you know, we're in between Rushmore and Devil's Tower and Yellowstone. So there's, there's almost like a tourist thing going through there. So we ended up with a lot of, a lot of people that were YouTube subscribers that had seen us online, came by, stopped by to say hi. While they're there, they'll buy a T-bone. Off you go. So it worked out good, and uh, now, so in two, well, this year, in January, we decided to take the leap, and we decided to completely break away from the uh, traditional cattle markets, and now everything that we have on the ranch is offered directly to end consumer. Everything that you do there? Everything. I remember you came out and visited, what, a couple of years ago? Yep. And I took Zach around and gave him the whole tour of the place, and we went back to the farm store. And I think the first thing you said was, you, you actually sell stuff to people here? And it was like, yeah, this is, you know, we're feeding people. And that's right. what we do. Yeah, very cool. Uh, I believe that was the day that I got employee of the month. It was. You did get employee <laughs> yeah. of the month. Yeah, we got a picture of uh, Zach standing behind our cash register. Doing yeah, you didn't. You didn't tell me what you were doing at the time. You just made me awkwardly stand there and take a picture. And then a the month later, I got a plaque in the mail. Do. The awkward part, I didn't have to do anything with that. That was all you. That was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good at that. Very good at that. <laughs> Natalie, I know you, you've you taken a little bit of a different turn and turned social media into a business. Talk, talk about that. Yeah, so when I, I knew the potential of social media when I entered social media just from – um, like I said, I originally started with direct to consumer and my, my goal with that was just to sell a product. Um, but through my experience there, I knew you could do brand partnerships. I could knew you, you could do YouTube monetization. I knew there, there were these other avenues to make money online. So when I had pivoted to sharing our own personal story, I kind of knew the potential there and kind of had a game plan, but n nowhere near to what I had, you know, I'm doing now. And so I originally started with like brand partnerships and working with companies that way for monetization. Um, but then when you start doing that, you realize really quickly that, um, you know, you can, you're not really in control of who's coming to you. Um, and why also when you've worked so hard to build a community in front of you, are you selling for other people? And so you kind of, this light bulb kind of clicks where you're like, you know, what can I create of my own? Um, and I had for a long time, my DMs had always been full of, you know, advice and questions and just asking um, how to, you know, to do, how to share, how to get started, how to make money online. And so I have hosted retreats um, and earned money that way. Um, and now I have the online course um, that teaches that earns revenue that way. Um, and then um, the podcast space too. So, so you're, you're actually teaching people and helping them figure out how to use social media themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've never wanted to be a gatekeeper of information and um, everyone up here would attest that like when you are <laughs> in it, you learn a lot, you make a lot of mistakes. Um, and it's not something you can just Google really easily. Like I have a ranch. I want to learn how to like start a YouTube and make money from it. And so I felt like, um, you know, we're a niche within a niche, like earning income from online is already a niche. And then going one layer deep and being like earning it from agriculture is like even a smaller group of who you can reach out to for resources. And so I just felt really compelled to share that because I had always had a community that I could lean onto. There was kind of a, you know, core group of females I had found online that were sharing and we had always been bouncing ideas back of, off of each other. And I just felt like, oh man, there's probably so many out there in agriculture who want to kind of capitalize on this or also do what we're doing. And I could tell from my DMs people had wanted to. And I just thought, like there's a need for it and I can, you know, I can fill this. And so. So <clears throat> along those lines where we're talking about making social media a business here, but 
at the same time, there's a level of advocacy to everything that we, we do. Uh, you know, everybody up here at some level wants to be an advocate for the industry. How do you balance being an advocate versus trying to make money on social media? How do you balance that? And I'll let whoever wants to take that go ahead. You're both looking at me. <laughs> I think I've talked a lot. I think uh, for me there, so okay, you want to know how do we balance using it as a business and doing advocacy? Right, because what's where's the line between am I being an advocate for agriculture or am I trying to make money? Yes. <laughs> for me, for me, fair question. Huh? For, for me, it's honestly the same. So um, I'm, I'm not doing quite what you know these guys are doing in terms of running it as a business. Um, I, I tell people all the time for me, it's better to be lucky than good. And, and we're living examples of that. So we started, like I said, we started on TikTok. And if anybody, you, you guys probably can attest, you know, you're not going to make money on TikTok unless you know a brand. I think I might make like a dime a day sometimes. It's it's nothing. And even so with your dancing skills? <laughs> even with the dancing skills, Zach. Because like, that's, that's, that's disappointing. I know. Yeah, we could double up. There's very little hope for you on TikTok for <laughs> dancing too. Um, but we stayed on TikTok for a long time, mainly for the advocacy part. Advocacy, you know, it was a great way to reach a different uh, consumer. You typically you're going to be a little bit of a younger crowd on TikTok, though. I mean, there's that's kind of changing though too. TikTok's becoming quickly one of the most downloaded apps. But for us, it was just about trying to educate, and so that's how we were using TikTok. And if I'm going to be very frank, I started getting on Facebook because I was getting close to being banned on TikTok. I was one video away. And so I kind of had to quit posting there and I guess showing cows calving and talking about artificial insemination is graphic content, according to TikTok. So Facebook became a backup. And so then we started sharing on Facebook. And I started that like late July last year. And I basically for the first few months just dumped every TikTok onto Facebook because Facebook just started doing reels, which is their version of TikTok. Um, I started talking to another dairy farmer out in Oregon, uh, Derek Josie, TDF Honest Farming. He's, he's been doing Facebook for a lot longer than I have. And he was kind of telling me, you know, he thought I'd be really good at it. So I'm getting a little long winded here. But effectively, what happened was sometime in October, November, a lot of the videos on Facebook started going viral. And so we started gaining a, a large following on that. And then Facebook got to the point where it started monetizing. So my uh, attention shifted from being mostly TikTok and reposting to Facebook because, again, if I'm being blunt, Facebook monetizes, TikTok doesn't. Mm -hmm. We post to Facebook and then I will post that to TikTok later on. So that's a dirty secret. If you want the ad free version, <laughs> wait two weeks and find it on TikTok. <laughs> so for me, the, the education is what we started first and then the monetization just followed after. So if they're kind of one in the same breath for me. I yeah. I also think it's like a time, like your input into it. So like we all get on and we start sharing. Like I would, I would, if I asked everyone in this room to raise their hand, like who wants to advocate for agriculture, we'd all say like, yes. And we're all probably mm. doing it in some form. Like, I mean, you're all probably sharing part of your, you know, ag story online in some way, whether it's small or large. Mm -hmm. um, but there becomes a point where like you're investing a lot of your time and energy into it. And I think that's when it shifts from like, okay, I'm no longer maybe just doing this to like advocate. I'm doing it now like to earn money for my family or an income or a business because like you just can't invest all that time and energy into it without a little bit of an ROI. Right. That actually led perfectly into my next question. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, Laura, you started, was it a year and a half ago? Uh, 2020. 2020? A yeah, couple so years like, ago. Yeah, it's like two years ago. So you've gone in the last two years from just starting out to where you are now. Mm -hmm. And uh, Natalie just mentioned time. So on that same thought, are you surprised at the amount of time it takes to not just film the video, but to edit the video, to get it posted, to deal with emails behind the scenes of whoever you're working with? Gotcha. Talk about that. Like, yeah. are, are you surprised by that? And how do you manage that? Um, I guess so. My original barrier to entry, I feel like everyone has always wanted a YouTube channel. I don't care if you're an ag, whatever you're doing. Everyone I know has always wanted to start a YouTube channel, but I think people think there's this large barrier to entry of time. And that's what I thought too, because I was just on Instagram and Twitter and that was really easy. When a thought pops into my head, I just tweet it out quick and there's no editing that goes into it. And so I thought, my goodness, to have a YouTube channel, you need to have like 
millions of dollars worth of equipment and a super fancy editing computer. I don't know the first thing about editing videos. I mean, what in the world? Like Natalie said, there's not a lot of information out there. Like how to start a YouTube channel and be good at it. And so I just started filming with my phone. And that's to this day what I film with. Everything I put on YouTube is filmed on my iPhone. And I airdrop it onto my laptop. And I edit it in free iMovie. And I put pretty minimal effort into my editing. I don't do a lot of fancy transitions. I just use whatever the free stuff is. And so I've found that I started off my audience, their expectations are like <laughs> <laughs> on the ground for content. Um, but I do spend quite a lot of time on backend stuff. I probably spend at least two hours a day solely focused on my phone or computer on social media stuff. Maybe not all of that is editing, but just like communicating with people up here, learning from them, getting ideas, seeing what's trending like on TikTok. Um, I do spend a lot of time on my phone. I mean, it looks like I'm an addict, but to some degree, I still have to get work done. I mean, I'm a farmer first, the YouTube just kind of, and social media stuff I post because I'm going to be working and doing these things and struggling anyways. I might as well be sharing my story and the terrible things I have to do, <laughs> have to do with an audience. Um, but I guess I am now surprised at how much of my day I allot to it. But in the beginning, it started off with very, very little time. And I feel like kind of expanding off that. It doesn't take much to get started. All you need is a phone and a story. Essentially, I guess like my answer to that would be it takes as much time as you allow it to take. Yeah. Whatever you feel like you need to do to justify that time or however it works out. I mean, I think everybody's a little bit different. Grant, you have gone from really being a like a full-time YouTuber, right? To what you're doing now, which is kind of like what a lot of us are doing where we're farming and you're YouTubing about it. What is what is that like? What's the difference between the two there? And how has that surprised you at all? Yeah, so I was able, like all four years of college, just after I got done with college courses and working out or whatever, at night, I was able to get a video done in like four or five hours. I post a video every single day on the Farming Simulator YouTube channel. And then I started doing real life videos. And, you know, that Farm Sim stuff, it takes like four or five hours. And I'll spend like three days getting footage and then put together the video. And I'm like, man, this is tough compared to, I mean, it's pretty easy what we're doing, but compared to, uh, compared to farm sim and stuff. So it's really, it, de it definitely takes a lot more time doing, doing this real life stuff for sure. That's, that's one thing I've learned um, over time. And you can't post as many videos unless you have like a, a full-time editor. And so that's what I've done with uh, the squad channel is I've hired a full-time editor and then I'm working them into working on the real life channel too, to editing real life videos. The squad is your farming simulator. Squ the squad is farming simulator okay. channel. Yep. Are you still doing farm simulator stuff on that channel? Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I do it <laughs> not every day now, um, but right. every two or three days. Yeah. That's so you sounds like a farm lot of work. all day and then go home and pretend to farm. Exactly. And then exactly. edit the videos then, of him farming. I'll, have, I'll be, I'll have a neighbor help me out. And I'm like, Hey, I gotta leave. I gotta leave the farm at eight o'clock. I gotta go home. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like playing farming similar. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I play the Sims. Yeah. <laughs> that is a unique thing to have to explain to people. Sometimes, yes. huh? Yeah. Uh, do you guys get the, the comment that I get a lot that, that focuses around wasting our time. Do you get the comment from these guys or girls that think that you're wasting your time on social media when you should be out working? And how do you handle that? I get, are you faking everything you're doing? I think, I don't know. I don't know if it's a, if, cause I'm a girl or what, but I get a lot of comments saying like, man, it must, you must put a lot of work into faking all of this. Or I, I had a conversation last night. Um, I do have all irrigated ground. And so I've got like 25 pivots that are constantly breaking down. And so I was hauling a gearbox around and those things were like pretty heavy. And the guy was like, I am looking at you now and there's just no way that was real. Where did you find an aluminum gearbox? To haul around and film that video and I was like oh my goodness <laughs> no like I spend enough time farming and editing I can't imagine the work I would have to put in to fake all of this kind of stuff and if I was going to fake something it definitely wouldn't be farming so something. you don't have a you don't have a team behind the scenes that's ordering props and coming up with scripts no uh-uh no makeup artists no props yeah, yeah that's all I got 
You so, just green screen everything. Just green screen. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. That's interesting. That's a much easier way to do Isn't it. it though? Yeah. yeah. I think we'll we'll get that when I do certain kinds of videos. So we'll what kind of jump started some of our page and getting some traction with the different app algorithms was I would take uh you know a certain animal rights activist creator like Joey Carbstrong was some nut out there and he's doing some video about you know animal or dairy farming abusing animals whatever fill in the blank i would take their videos and show their blurps and then show like the obvious truth and the contrast made it somewhat entertaining but overwhelmingly some of the comments i got was like why are you doing that you're never going to change his mind like i know that i know i'm not going to change his mind mm -hmm. but because of the interaction and the the back and forth between you know and usually they don't get back to me but just by getting the engagement on that video you're going to catch a lot of people in the crossfire but you still you do get those comments from people where you know they're usually either just jealous bitter or they just want to be a troll mm -hmm. along those lines then when it comes to negative comments i know like for me personally when i started out I was really thinking that my viewers would be non-farmers. That's who I thought was going to watch my videos. It's about 50-50 now between farmers and non-farmers. But what I thought I was going to get negative comments on was from non-farmers about pesticides and GMOs, and drain tile and livestock and those kinds of things. But I was wrong. 100% of my negative comments come from other farmers. Hmm. Every single one of them all the time. You guys, you guys found that? Same I was going to say like, it can be hard. Yeah. I think oh, there's oh. there's a certain level of almost jealousy that happens because we do get opportunities that, for, first of all, they blow your mind. Like when you have a company call you and say, "Hey, you know, we'd like you to test this piece of equipment for us, and it's worth a hundred thousand dollars, and you're trusting me to, to to test it just because you know I'm going to make a video about it." I mean, it's humbling, but at the same time, it's a, it's a really unique opportunity because I like to look at it as we're helping other farmers and ranchers. So if I'm testing a new uh, squeeze chute for cattle and, and we're testing to see how safe it is, you know, and I've got my kids out running it and stuff like that. And uh, that's an opportunity for me to help the industry. It can be taken a number of different ways. Right. Yeah. Right. And the people making negative comments against that would love to test that squeeze chute. Oh, yeah. In, in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like the negative comments, we, I get a lot from people who don't understand dairy industry. And I always tell people I don't blame people for not knowing what they don't know. So those kind of negative comments don't bother me as bad. It is the ones from other farmers that do get to you. They're supposed to be on your side. And they're the ones that, you know, might kind of, if you're having an off day already, those are the ones that might wear you down a little bit more. But uh, you just you just learn to deal with it. And if, and if they're jealous of what we're doing, you know, or some opportunities that might happen, it's like, well, this isn't easy either. It's not like this was handed mm -hmm. to us. I mean, each one of us can say it, but we've put a lot of work into where we're into the stuff that we've done and it hasn't come easy by any means either. So there's something to be said about putting yourself out there. And some people are too scared to do that. And those are the ones that might hold some bitterness, unfortunately. Well, and, and you're a farmer and you know, you, you not every day is good. Like you have horrible days, right? So if, if I'm working and I'm having a really bad day and I come in and I'm watching Zach do something and, and, and as my, myself, I like to just think of it as, you know, somebody had a bad day, they're taking it out on me. I'm a, I'm faceless almost to a point, you know, like I'm just an easy punching bag, take it out on me, have your bad day. We'll start over again tomorrow. Yeah. That's probably a good way to look at it. Yeah. Natalie, how do you, uh, work people through that that you're working with how do you prepare them for that kind of thing well i was gonna say i actually starting to love my community more and more <laughs> i have a pretty supportive and positive uh community i don't deal with a lot of negativity and i actually kind you, of you can go back there yeah. then we're done with you <laughs> um i always answer this because i do feel like there's a barrier to people who so people will come to me and say like, how do we, and in our online course, we actually talk about this. We have a whole advocacy module and we talk about, because um, my co-founder, co my partner uh, is a New Mexico milkmaid, Tara Vanderdus, and she's in the dairy. And I do think the dairy industry gets hit a little bit harder than, you know, like I'm showing my cattle out at pasture, like we're kind of scenic and though, beautiful. <laughs> and so you guys, you guys take a brunt that like, um, I guess my content just doesn't take. Um, so I definitely understand that it's a reality and I do like to prepare people for it. But I also like to let people know that like 99% of my experience online has been overwhelmingly positive. And so there have been people that want to share and they're like, my spouse is afraid activists are going to show up or my spouse will let me talk about this or, you know, I don't want to talk about this because I'm afraid. And that just, um, there's nothing that upsets me more that someone is not sharing simply because of kind of this, you know, the fault, I don't want to say false fear, but like this idea that it's like such a negative space online because again i have had like a really positive experience and i would um i don't know i just don't ever want people to think that that it's all big bad and scary online 
Well, and the thing is, it's your page too. So if any of you guys have a Facebook, TikTok, YouTube page, and those kind of comments are coming on your page, get rid of it. It's it's your page. If yeah. they're bothering you, don't let them don't let them do it. Yeah, those are great points. You know, especially like what you were saying, Natalie. It's it's easy to see that negative comment and just let it eat you up. But you have to remember that at least 99% of the stuff is positive. Mm -hmm. It's just for whatever reason, the negative ones stand out that much more, right? Um, so positive or negative, do any of you have some good examples of any kind of crazy comments that you've gotten, stuff that surprised you or ticked you off or, or just thrown you for a complete loop? I get accused a lot of being a paid actor for the dairy industry, which I feel like is a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> but So you're a real farmer. I'm a real farmer. Yeah, that's oh. right. No, we get those kind of comments. I think for me, you know, the, some of the, one of the most rewarding experiences, I guess this maybe isn't a, uh, it's not necessarily a comment per se, but just uh, a comment on a video, but just from the social media life is um, even like going to the World Dairy Expo, something that just blew my mind was just people stopping to say hi. And well, they weren't even saying hi, but where I was just extremely humbled was the amount of people that just stopped and said, thank you. And that was, I never expected that because I was just doing it for fun and but there's, there's just the amount of people from our own industry that actually, you know, like Nat said, 99% of it is good. And that was that was one of my most probably rewarding experiences from this whole social media journey. Yeah. I guess I try not to highlight the fact that I'm like a woman in ag. I'm just a farmer. And one something that's been really rewarding for me is when like a little girl will come up to me and she said, I had no idea that I could be the one in the tractor or the combine. And I have really found a love for running big equipment. And so when I can share that love and then maybe even inspire one person and it just happens to be an adorable little girl, that has been something that's been super rewarding for me. That is, that is really cool. What is the most unexpected uh, thing that social media has done for you on or off the farm? Grant? Yeah, I would say for me, it was just, uh, making the reality that, holy crap, I could farm someday. You know, it was a dream to farm. My dad never farmed, but my grandpa did, and I was never going to farm with my grandpa. And so I was like, wow, if I keep working at this, man, someday we could I could actually start a farm. And so that was like, I never thought it was going to happen when I made that first video. How, how long was it from the time that you kind of realized that and you had that reality check to when you actually went out and bought your first piece of dirt? It, it was probably four or five years, so... Really, when, once you kind of start making a little money, it's like, okay, if I scale this up, if I keep working hard at it, I'll eventually get there. So it probably took four or five years, I'd say. So you, you, but you spent several years there with that goal in mind. Yep. And you yep. kept working at it, and that's really cool. That's awesome. Um, by education, I'm actually a pharmacist. And so before I married my husband, I worked full time in pharmacy. And then when we got married, I worked part time. And if you had told me I would not be a pharmacist anymore and I would be full time um, making income for our family um, through um, sharing online myself and then teaching other people how to, I probably would not have believed you. So I think that's been kind of the most radical shift that social media has brought into my life. For sure. <laughs> yeah, for us, we uh, like I mentioned in 2017, we were battling with drought and we thought we were going to lose the ranch. And YouTube, um, honestly, saved the ranch. We were able to do uh, the direct-to-consumer. We, we now sell beef online, beef and pork online, and we ship it all over the U.S. And I don't think that without YouTube, um, I think the ranch would have been sold a long time ago, and I'd be off. I'd probably be in pharmacy school. <laughs> <laughs> maybe a different kind of pharmacist, if you know what I mean. I don't know. <laughs> what? <laughs> I just like maybe a different kind of, that he might be a drug dealer. But <laughs> legalize. Hashtag legal. I Maybe mean, that's an inappropriate joke to make. I don't know. Yeah, I don't really have anything that really jumps to the front of my mind. Um, cause, I mean, for me, life still continues on. You know, dairy farming is busy on its own. But, um, you know, there's been some crazy experiences. To I was in Kentucky for a random trip, and my Uber driver knew who I was. Hmm. That was kind of eye-opening that I have to be careful for what I do and say hmm. in, in public. But, um you know, the only thing that comes to mind too is hearing everybody talk about the success and stuff they had is for everybody here listening. If you've thought about starting a channel, but you think there's not enough room, you know, and you're discouraged for that. That's something I thought a lot. Like we had Derek Josie on Facebook. He had, you know, 700,000 followers when I started and I'm never going to, you know, come close to that. I just thought he had it conquered. And, 
um, you know, there was no reason to hop on. So I, I feel like what something that's just really stuck out to me is there, there's room for everybody. I mean, there's 350 million people in our country and a high tide raises all boats. So, I mean, if you've thought about jumping on and you think just because some of us have, you know, have had some success that, you know, we've taken all the viewers, <laughs> you're not even, we're not even close. There's a lot of people that need to be reached yet. He's old and retiring soon. He's too, retiring. Anyway, so. <laughs> The act, I mean, the actor that plays Zach Johnson. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing I noticed even with the, the agricultural space on, on social media is there isn't that competition there. You know, we're not against each other. We're all there to help each other. And that's the way it is across, you know, the board for agriculture. At least it should be. And uh, it's definitely represented here on the stage and, and across all social media, I hope. Yeah. Well, that kind of leads me into the last question that I've got for you guys before we open it up to questions from the audience. But if you had some simple advice for anybody that's thinking about getting into activating, activating, advocating, <laughs> activating their advocacy, <laughs> um, advocating, whether it's online or in some other way, I mean, maybe it's best to bring it back to what you do. But what would your advice be to somebody that's thinking about, you know, for me, it would be starting a YouTube channel because that's probably the best thing I could relate to. But my advice would be to just do it and, and don't overcomplicate it. You know, you don't need... $10,000 worth of fancy equipment. Mm -hmm. you, you really just need a cell phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mine's a little similar to yours. I always, in our online course, I talk a little bit about how like clarity comes through action. Um, mm -hmm. So you could sit and think about like the perfect content you want to create or what it's exactly going to look like. Um, but I like looking at my, you know, my own journey from what I started sharing to what I'm sharing now and like the way I'm running social media and where I'm investing my time has completely changed. Um, so don't waste the time trying to like perfect um, what you're going to implement online, I would just get started because it's probably going to change in three months and then it's probably going to change again in the next three months. And then in the year, you're going to look back and be like, I'm not even doing close to what I thought I was originally doing. So I always think that like, at least for me, again, I go back to that, like clarity comes through action. So just get started. Yeah. Get, get doing what you want to do. And then, you know, feel you free also to buy my course. Oh, that'll <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you, you pick your route and, and what you want to do, but be, be prepared to change. Uh, when COVID hit in 2020 in March, uh, we were just making a couple videos a week and pumping them out there. And, you know, we realized there's a bunch of people sitting at home who know nothing about agriculture and have nothing else to do but watch YouTube. So we actually started what we called the 30 and 30. And I know all these guys went, oh, my God, that guy's nuts. But we made a video a day for 30 days and we wrapped it up with a 24 hour live stream. Hmm. and uh, it was insane, and by the end of it, I was extremely cranky, but now we've done it for, what, three years now, so it's it's one of those things that you, you see the opportunities out there, and you sometimes just have to just have to grab them. So this is more my personal opinion, but if you're thinking about starting sharing about, you know, your farm or doing advocacy, but you're not sure which app to start, I do think TikTok is a good app to start on. Hmm. Um, you just need your phone, and you can do a lot of trial and error and just figure out what works, what doesn't work, you know, where, what's, what's your niche want to be? Do you want to be the person, you know, like that is advocating on row crops? If you have a dairy, do you want to do dairy? How do you want to do dairy? Do you want to be aggressive and go on the offense? Do you want to be on the defense? And I go back and look at my first TikToks from last March and they're awful. They're horrible. And I hate looking at myself. You can see the phone shaking visibly on my first one. And so you got to give yourself a lot of grace. Do 10 videos and they're going to suck. I mean, maybe you'll probably be better than I am, but um, don't hold yourself. You know, you don't have to be a millennial farmer on day one. You know, it, it, you're going to have to have some trial and error and you're going to have to let yourself fail. Um, I think in the time I've been doing it, there's been a couple of videos that I backpedaled on. I was like, I don't like the way I said that. So I, you know, I took it down and you can't be afraid to admit mistakes and, and learn. I do think TikTok has the ability to give you some grace and, and give you an ability to figure out, you know, what you want to do and how you want to do it. Hmm. Um, I guess I hear a lot about people who don't want to start sharing what they're doing on their farm because they are afraid that it's going to limit their opportunities in their specific community. So not necessarily that they're going to be reaching people across the world, but that their neighbor across the road is going to watch it and be like, wow, he's doing something really stupid. I don't want to rent him any ground or it's going to like affect the way they're seen in their communities. And I would say, at least in my experience, that's not the truth at all. Um, and then I would say at some point, you, like they were saying, you just kind of have to start, you know? I mean, you can film something every single day and just sit down at the computer. And honestly, sometimes I sit down at the computer, I look at it, I'm like, this is kind of horrible. But you know what? I'm just going to put it out anyways. Because if you don't do that, you will be stuck with a GoPro and 10 SD cards full of years of footage, and you'll never do anything with it. So at some point, you kind of just have to start. 
Um, and I would say all of us are still definitely um, in the learning phase. I don't think you've ever like mastered what you're doing. You just kind of keep doing it and learning as you go. Um, but we're a pretty welcoming group. So we're always taking applications for <laughs> farmers on social media, but we're pretty friendly. We'll welcome you in the fold. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, to piggyback off the, what they said, it, I agree with all of them and stuff. Uh, but one thing when talking to a bunch of YouTubers, it ends up being that a lot of them are like, I kind of just got lucky. They just start posting random videos. And then it was one video that went off and got, you know, two or three times more views than the other videos. And they kind of just piggybacked off that. And that's really how somebody, it seems like they get their channel going. Um, so it's almost like fortune favors the bold where you just go out and, and make a bunch of stuff happen. And, and see what bites on YouTube. And so I, I know that happened with me when I made a video, it ended up going viral. And so I kind of just piggybacked off that video and that's really how the channel kind of grew. I would say also just to do one more thing, don't be afraid to like just direct message anybody, even like large brands. Yeah. You'd be shocked at the amount of brands, even when I had just like a couple hundred followers, just because I introduced myself in a direct message. I said, here's my email address. I know I don't have many followers, but at some point I would love to work with your brand. And they're like, you know what? Thanks for reaching out. You'd be shocked. Not a lot of people do. They're like, you know what? Let's be honest. You're too small for us to work with right now, but we'll keep we'll, we'll keep uh, you in our in our mind for maybe later on. So I would just say, like you say, fortune favors the bold. Just send a direct message. You'd be shocked at how many people would respond. All right, um, we got a little bit of time left here. Uh, I think we want to open it up to some questions out in the crowd. I know there's a microphone right there. There's a couple throughout. If anybody's got a question go ahead and, and put these guys on the spot. I'm just the moderator, so <laughs> see if you can make them uncomfortable. I bet Zach would answer a question, too. You can pepper him maybe for a little bit. Nope, I'm the moderator. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. My name's Austin from Central Illinois. I'm a swine farmer. Uh, I got a question for Dan. Me and my other swine people I farm with, we always want to put videos of our swine farm and how we're doing things, and especially like in the hog barns, our ventilation and how the hogs are taken care of better inside a building. And we like to describe to people how we inject manure. Sometimes we do some press of drag lines three miles away and how we like to do like 6,500 gallon per acre to 10,000. But we always get the older generation of our fathers who say, don't you dare put any of that on social media. <laughs> we do not want the EPA to see any of this. Do not put any of this on record at all but we'd love to show people that but we're all just too scared of the hog industry to do anything like that i there's people in my own industry that don't like what i do and i guess that kind of piggybacks off some of the zach asked earlier like if there's comments i get to you and that does get to me a little bit um they think you know maybe we go too much on the offense but we'll show um if there's a calf that dies or if there's a cow that dies we had one um we the cow we i showed the whole thing i Hint, if you need to show something graphic on Facebook, put it in black and white and blur it, and they can never flag it for graphic content. <laughs> Found that out with this video. Oh, um, we we did this all on Facebook. You can find the video. I don't think I showed the euthanization part, but it was immediately after that we euthanized the cow. We cut the calf out. We resuscitated the calf. We were working on that. We showed the entire thing. Again, I blurred it just a little bit, right? That was a phenomenally popular video and everybody commented how much they just loved the transparency and that's the key word i think is transparency if you show people what you're doing and you're honest about it and you're not trying to beat around the bush you're you're honest about what you do and you're transparent that we do it this way because of you know the, the reasons that you and your father do it and hopefully i mean i'm trusting they're good reasons just like i keep my my dairy cows are in a confinement barn they're not pasture raised in Iowa for where we're at for good reasons. And those reasons I'm transparent about and I'm honest about. Do they get pasture? No. Here's why. Some people think that answer might be blunt because you see the cart carton of Walmart butter has a red barn and a green pasture. There's no Walmart butter that comes from a red barn and green pasture. So I think being transparent even in the swine industry about how pigs are raised, even if people don't initially understand it, showing how it is for the welfare of the animal, for bio, I mean, from what little I know, for biosecurity reasons, for your labor reasons, and for the overall production and efficiency of the system. I think if you're transparent and honest, I think you hit the nail on the head. Fortune favors the bold. And I, I think I think it would work very well. I've often wondered if, you know, people from the swine would kind of uh, start jumping on social media a little more. I know there's a few creators on TikTok that do a really good job and they show exactly what you're talking about and they, they catch some flack in the comments, but at the end of the day, they're transparent. 
I know you didn't <clears throat> didn't ask me, but I'm going to <laughs> add to this. Um, context is really important. So Sandy Brock, who does uh, YouTube for sheep, talks about this a lot, about how if you're going to be showing uh, information or visual, whether visual or verbal, make sure you're giving context around it. And don't just assume because you talked about it in the last video yes. that your audience knows and it's fine and you can move on and show this because you addressed it five videos ago. Everyone knows this mm -hmm. um, because I don't remember who, but someone said like one video will pop off for you. You. And if there's not the full context in that video, then I think that's where a lot of that negativity and, you know, kind of like that scarcity stuff that you're scared of could come into play. So I think if you want to show it, uh, just make sure you're giving like all that verbal, yeah. visual information you need to give the full context. Um, and TikTok, I, I that could be hard to do because uh, you only got one yeah, minute. So, but at least, you know, in the caption or somewhere, tag the other video, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, that would provide said context. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I know Zach has spoken to this on his YouTube channel. Uh, you have the stop private property sign at the end of your driveway. And I just want to know, like, I, Mike, I know you've spoken to this on Off the Husk, but to the rest of the panel, what have, have you had problems with crazy fans trying to like hunt you down? <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, it's, it, we're, we're really accessible. Whereas, you know, like, you know, Zach's got a driveway and he's got a sign that says, Hey, this is a private driveway turn around. Uh, with a, we have a farm store on the ranch. We have, uh, we're on a major highway. Uh, we have fans that stop by all the time. And sometimes there is a little bit of that, uh, um, a, a little limits are pushed occasionally. We'll have people knock on our door at eight o'clock on a Sunday morning and just want to say hi. Um, but uh, overall it's, it's pretty easy to deal with and we haven't had, I don't know, in five years, I probably had a handful of issues where it, it went anywhere past that, so. Anyone else? We've definitely had people swing by. Um, I don't wanna like scare anybody, but like, the, I mean, to truly answer the question, if you know, in the effort of honesty, um, animal rights activists are pretty unhinged. Mm -hmm. And so they're the ones I get concerned about. And we've never had anybody show up to the farm, but we've had some actual credible threats online, um, like claiming to see my wife and kids in town. And those kind of comments. So um, we have had to actually talk with local law enforcement. We have um, actual cases and they'll find the person and say like, hey, and the, the scary part is they're actually like in Iowa sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, one of them was like in Fort Dodge. He's like, you want us to go pay him a visit? I'm like, no, he left me alone. So I mean, if, if Seth, I mean, I guess my point is if that kind of stuff happens, you know, there's people that can help you out with it, but um, it's never been a problem over and above that yeah i made a i made a video back in 2018 that was called the cost of ranching mm -hmm. and very i mean we basically laid everything out and we said this is how much it costs us to raise a cow um you know and this is how much we sell a cow for and this is how much we lose and this is how much money we make and uh other farmers in our in our area had a problem with that video and i, I was at a gas station one time and, and got into a confrontation with a guy that was pretty mad that i put that information out there and I feel, you know, if you're going to be an advocate and whether you're talking to farmers, ranchers or, or anybody else, you know, if you have all the information, they can make up their own mind without it. Everybody thinks that every rancher out there is loaded and, and uh, you know, is has it made. And unless you put the numbers out there, nobody knows. For anyone who's concerned about this, one thing I intentionally do is I never say the city that I live in, town, I don't know, city, the town I live in, I always say I'm from central Nebraska. So yes, if someone wanted to find my family, they could, you know, we have a bull sale catalog, we're in the registered business, so they could find, you know, our address on there. But in interviews online, I never say where I'm from, it's always central Nebraska. And I feel like that's helped protect, at least me like mentally thinking in my head, like I'm not like out there splashing around the city that I live in. Yeah, I would say the same thing because that's usually like the first question that people ask is like, oh, where do you farm at? You know, what do you buy? How can I find you? And I'd say I've also tried to be kind of vague, but the internet is just a wealth of information. And so if you look hard enough, I'm sure you could find a lot of information about me that I don't want published. I mean, scour the internet, you can probably find my phone number. If you look in my church directory, you know, or something like that. And I've had some people drop by and I know they're well-meaning, but I have just said a few times, you can't visit my farm or a working farm for your safety, for my safety, for biosecurity, for liability reasons. I can't have a guy just dropping by, hey, can I ride in the tractor with you? And you know, I don't want to run anybody over, you know? So I just, every once in a while, I'll put out a notice. Probably go viral. Yeah, I'll probably, yeah, I'm sure it would. Just sure start filming them, they'll get uncomfortable and leave. I guess, yeah. Yeah, uh, Aaron Newell. I'm actually by Fort Dodge. That wasn't me. And uh, how do you? 
how do you treat uh, personal attacks? Uh, for example, I had my son, 11 year old boy, uh, scooping grain that we spilled off the grain cart mm -hmm. and in shorts and people ripping the new one about wearing shorts. He's not real a farm kid. Is it best to ignore him? I was on TikTok, um, ignore him or, you know, it's pretty hard to not go and be attacked as your own, as your own son or family. It's your page. So, you know, <laughs> A lot, some of those comments, it depends what they are. If they're just, uh, there's one troll, and I was telling Zach this yesterday, he loves Zach's content, and he hates mine. <laughs> and he comments on like a half of my videos, like, I wish this guy was cool like Millennial Farmer. And uh, he'll say, I'm farming with daddy's That's my money. my second account. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he'll say, I'm farming with daddy's money and all this stuff. And some of those, they sometimes they want you to address them, is what I've learned. Mm -hmm. And if you leave them alone, they get buried into the stratosphere. Because especially with TikTok, the comments they get reacted with, Go to the top. Mm -hmm. So if you leave it alone, it'll disappear. Mm -hmm. So if, if it's a comment that I can use to educate somebody, like let's say they're, oh, why would you let your son do X, Y, Z? And I'll say, oh, hey, that's actually a good question. You know, then I'll address it. But if it's just a punk, and just leave them alone. Yeah. It's definitely beneficial to have a little bit thicker skin if you're going to share yeah. online. Um, and honestly, the longer you do it, the thicker your skin gets. And a lot of comments kind of just roll off your shoulder. Um, I always tell people when it comes to advocating and things like this, it really is about boundaries you set for yourself. Sometimes if I know I have a reel going viral that is one of my advocacy ones that I know is, you know, who knows what's going on in the comments. I just don't go visit the comments. And so sometimes like removing yourself from the situation, you can delete them if you want, you can respond back. I mean, it really comes down to personal boundaries and how you, it's like, I think of the online space as like your home. Like you could let someone in. If they say something, you can ask them to leave. You can, you know, it's like, it's really your home space. You get, you control of it. You get to do what you want. Yep. I, I find that if you have a little extra time, the most fun way to do it is to kind of just get under their skin with a quick little comment back. <laughs> yeah. You know, like in that situation, I would just ask the guy what grade he's in. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll work. It'll make him even more mad. So you can go that route too. I'll add that to my course. <laughs> Cal California has uh, been trying to impose their livestock standards on the country. You know, is it a Proposition 12 or whatever it is? And uh, some people have said we should just comply and move on. Others say, let's fight it out in court to, the, to let's, let that settle it. Do you have a position on that? Livestock? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's one of the kind of, that's some of the heat that I get sometimes is why I even try. Because uh, especially like even in the dairy industry, you know, there's cow-calf separation going on. There's artificial insemination going on. Um, I've, I've gotten questions from other dairy farmers, you know, why I even try. And what bothers me is, you know, we've had things like tail docking taken away from us, BST taken away from us. And there's probably some, you know, things behind those where aren't totally bad. But my, what bothers me is the concept that practices we were doing, which we had good reasons for, were taken away from us for uneducated reasons. And so I feel like we are the dairy industry. I can't speak for the other industries, but we're really behind the ball on being active on social media and, and you know, not even too much. We're defensive. We're not, none, we've never gone on the offense and say, Hey, we're doing this because of X, Y, Z. Um, but there, at the end of the day, I don't know what kind of change we could make in politics. You know, if there is going to be legislature coming in the Midwest, about artificial insemination or gestation crates or cow calf separation, but damn if I don't try. I mean, if there's if there's some video I can put out there that will go viral and reach the right audience, reach a senator, a politician, whatever. If it happens and I tried, I can say I tried. But if if that if we were able to somehow make an influence to stop that, I would. That would be an incredibly rewarding experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think legislation and that kind of stuff is hard. It's easy to say, like, you know, we'll just stand against it or we'll fight it or yeah. whatever. But I do think it's something that's important to keep your eye on. I mean, even what's going on in the Netherlands right now, um, if you think that's, like, far removed and across, like, you know, across the pond, it's not going to touch us. Um, I, I think our industry really needs to have its eye on, you know, how much we're letting, like, legislation control things and government. And I just... I think it's something that we have to keep in mind for sure. I don't know the answer, but um, I think it's really important. I think making noise at least helps. Yeah. I mean, at least we're trying. I think we got time for one more, according to the screen that just came up in front of us here. <laughs> Hi. Go ahead. Um, my oldest son is in high school, and he has been creating videos for the last couple of years, and he's been putting them on uh, his private YouTube channel, mostly to communicate with um, relatives, family, to kind of keep them in, you know, 
let them know what we're doing around on the farm. My question is, well, does anyone have any advice as to when the right time or, you know, how to go about allowing him to move from his private channel to a public channel and um, since he is a minor uh, and just in connection with that, how we would protect him, protect mm. ourselves and our property. How old is he? He'll be 16 in a couple of months. How far back do the videos go? Like when did he, what age was he when he started making them? Uh, he started in 2020. It kind of started uh, during COVID when everybody, you know, mm -hmm. had to go home from school mm -hmm. and it started to, as a school assignment actually, to mm -hmm. uh, keep in contact with family and stuff like that. Grant, you, you said you were 15 when you started? Yeah, I was 15 when I started. I, I definitely made some stupid mistakes and said some stupid stuff probably when I was 15. You look back and you probably cringe at it for sure. Um, and my parents didn't watch any of the videos or anything like that. So it was kind of just, I was on my own um, with that. But at a young age, it gave you opportunity to, to learn how to, how to do this social media thing, just trial and error doing that. So for sure, that would be big for him. But I see your point with, uh, you know, he could mess up or, or do something wrong or something on there. So it, it's tough. It's really, it seems like up to the kid kind of and you to, mm. yeah, it's. I don't know if there is a good answer. It's, I get asked a lot. About, I, so I have three boys. I get asked a lot about this, about like sharing my children online. Um, my oldest is in high school. And so he's actually shown the least because I try and respect his privacy the most. So that's always my first like point I go to with parents is like, can your children make the decision for themselves of what they want to show and how they want to be shown? And it sounds like he would have control of like, I mean, he's old enough to like state that that's different than like toddlers and um, you know, small children. So I think that's really important that like he wants to, he's taking the initiative to do it. I think the next thing would be like implementing some things, like if you were to make it public, Im implementing some things that would almost be like a little bit of a shield for him, or maybe you moderate comments, like he doesn't get to go through that yet, or you do it before to like maybe take out some of the negative ones that would affect him that, you know, you can kind of moderate that comment section to kind of barrier him through those years until he is like more, um, I don't know, like mature to handle kind of like the negative and positives that come with online. Mm -hmm. I think that was a good answer. And I, I would just add to that, you know, you know your kid. So I think if, if you feel okay about it, I don't think 16 is terribly young. But maybe it's a situation where, like Natalie was saying, you want to watch the comments or maybe you want to make sure that you watch the videos before he makes them public, that kind of thing. But Thank yeah. you. All right. Um, I think we're done here. So I think a few of us, maybe all of us, are going to head over to the social partners corner on the other side of the FBN booth. Um, some of us are going to have some apparel over there. We'll be standing around talking. Sounds like we've got happy hour going on over here. So. Thank you guys very much for coming. Hopefully we'll see some of you over there and uh, have fun tonight. Thanks, guys.